Hello and welcome to Tata Literature Live, the Mumbai International Lit Fest, co-sponsored by Tata Steel and Tata Projects and powered by Godridge. There will be a short Q&A at the end of the session, so please send in any questions that you may have in the comments section. Today's literary conversation is with Marlon James, a Jamaican author. He has won multiple awards for his various novels, including the 2015 Man Booker Prize for his previous novel, A Brief History of Seven Killings. His most recent novel, Black Leopard, Red Wolf, is the first novel in his genre-defying Dark Star trilogy and was a finalist for the 2019 National Book Award. His novels and today's conversation raise questions about literary norms set by privileged white male writers, as well as questions about the need to box books into absurdly specific categories. In conversation with Marlon today is Shalini Puri, author and professor of English. She has written two books, edited and contributed to four, and published several articles. Her work spans memory studies, indentureship, slavery and incarceration, social movements, and environmental humanities. Over to you, Shalini and Malin. Hello, good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Marlon James, a very warm welcome to you and to our audience. Thank um, you so much. Congratulations on your new trilogy, Dark Star and on the 2015 Man Booker Prize for your previous novel, A Brief History of Seven Killings. I Thank don't you. know Thank any you. writers more versatile or prolific than you. <laughs> your novels span historical fiction, realism, speculative fiction, fantasy, epic, and they are typically six or seven hundred pages long. <laughs> um, I think they are an ad for Kindle editions. Oh my God. <laughs> I need to try that, actually. Um, so, yeah, you should. So, it, it's really hard to introduce your work in a few words. So, for our short 40 minutes, I think the best introduction to you is you. Could you kick off our conversation by reading for maybe a, just a couple of minutes from your work so that our audience, to whom I'm also very thankful for being here, can hear you, and if you'd like to contextualize the passage, feel free. Sure, let me um, just make sure I'm reading the right thing. Um, let me... Um, as always, I freak, of course, I lose track of where... Oh, here it is, I think. Yep. Um, so this is... um. Uh, one of the characters, his name is Demos, and he's one of the the boys who were in the plot to kill Bob Marley. He's actually one of the boys who end up showing up, and um, I'm I'm just getting rid of all this glare. It's morning in New York, and um, this is a scene of him the night before. He's not exactly having conflicts, but he's being weighed by all these sort of internal demons in a way. And this is the night before they go about doing the thing that will change Jamaica's trajectory, everybody's life. So this is him. It says, this is how bad man wake up. Never go to sleep. I wasn't sleeping when Funky Chicken, that's the one of the characters, with the heroin shakes, start to walk over in his sleep saying Leviticus, Leviticus, Leviticus over and over. Me never did sleep neither when Heckler ran over to the window and tried to push himself out. Bam Bam sleeping, but he's sitting on the floor and leaning against the wall, and the whole night he didn't move. My dream awake about the brethren who leave me poor and came on his racetrack. We make the heat right up his me like, in me like a fever, then take it back down and make it rise again. You can do that the whole night. Last night, Josie took me aside and said, the man come back from Ethiopia two nights ago. This is how you can make a thing you lost for keep you awake. This is how you know most men in the room too young. Not an hour after they fall asleep, they start moaning and mumbling. And if you is the fat man from jungle, you call out a woman name three times. Darkas or Dora, me can't remember. Only young men get wet dream. Heckle in the corner, sinning. Only young men can sleep with all the burdens crushing down on two shoulders. Like God just get tired of carrying burden and throw it on you. I, I didn't sleep. I'm not even sleepy. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mm. 
That is quite a feat. I think both the Book of Night Woman, Women and A Brief History are almost entirely written in Jamaican Patois or Creole. And I just, I give thanks that the publishers recognized its importance. <laughs> um, I wondered... They didn't with, they didn't with, um, um, with Book of Night Woman. Um, it went around to 16 publishers. Only one took it. Wow. Wow. Yes, I know. I mean, all writers in the audience should know the story of your first book and its 78 rejections. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but uh, yeah, yeah, it was, it was, it was re rejected 78 times, John Crow's Devil. But I think what people think sometimes is after that, it was smooth sailing ahead. I'm like, no, <laughs> the second novel was also rejected by every ma ma major publisher except one. And um, and yeah, there 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 is still it has come a long way, and I hope I you know I hope writers like me um, help he, did, did some of that. But it took a long time. Um, I remember a publisher who shall remain nameless, Viking UK, told me, <laughs> would I consider rewriting Book of Night Woman in Queen's English? Basically, make it a Jane Austen novel. I'm like Jane Austen already wrote her novels, so yeah. why would I? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Do you hear any similarities between Patois and Indian English or English? In oh, absolutely, which is probably why I read so many Indian novels. I think um, one of the things we have in common, I was talking funny enough to an Indian and a Sri Lankan writer about this, about our struggles with, with standard English, that... um. The, it, the standard English we learned was a very servile and verbose English. We basically learned the butler's English. You know, um, English language taught us a lot of things. Like it, it taught us to be cheeky, but it didn't teach us irony. And I have a feeling the reason why the British didn't teach us irony is because they know we'd start laughing at them. Um, but there was, and we talk about that, that um, the struggles with, with so-called standard English, the struggle with with um, what do we do with the voice that's in our own heads, yeah. the language coming out of our own, you know, coming out of our own tongues. And I think that um, for a writer like me, I look all over the quote-unquote commonwealth for how to deal with that. It, it means reading and rereading Arundhati Roy. It means reading and rereading All About Hatter. Um, it means, you know, it, it means reading, um, you know, Midnight's Children and Shame to just figure out how, how do I liberate this really stultifying tongue? So in that sense, um, Indian, Sri Lankan and, and Nigerian novels became really important. Yeah. It's interesting. When I was um, reading... Um, brief history and also I think some of the struggles around it I was also thinking about Indra Sinha, Animals, People and um, uh, Sea of Poppies um, mm -hmm. Amitav's book because they also I mean they do the same kind of inventive literary um, renditions of mm -hmm. Indian English with all its kind of vitality and that kind of pairing of dwelling in pain and incredible expressive energy and insight yeah. so so yeah yeah but there's also there's also something that you know we we should take a little credit for i think we saved english honestly um you know i think i think indian english i think jamaican english i think nigerian english in in space it saved english i think it brought with it a dynamism that the language on its own just wouldn't have survived Right. And funny enough, sometimes the, the place you see that the most is actually England. And the yep. way in which the, the in English English has evolved. And honestly, it wouldn't have happened without us. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, one of the things that Ghosh says is that every word in Sea of Poppies is now in the Oxford English Dictionary. So it is that kind <laughs> of expanding of the language that I also see so much in your work. Um, Okay, I have one other question before kind of moving into a discussion mm -hmm. of your newest work. Um, and that is, in A Brief History, you make a mischievous reference to V.S. Naipaul. Right. And Naipaul is probably the best known Caribbean writer in India. 
though I'm hoping that you and some other Caribbean writers will change that. <laughs> um, so could you briefly, just briefly talk about what you see as Naipaul's literary significance mm -hmm. or shadow? Well, I think his literary significance is that he brought a clarity and a maturity and a sort of a ruthless, ruthless is the wrong word, but I'm going to use it anyway, a kind of a ruthless sort of clarity and simplicity to our literature. I also think Naipaul at his best can enter a situation and in a very quick time judge it correctly, um, judge it perfectly when he's on, I think, uh, in, in some ways, you know, which is why he may be the rare fiction and nonfiction writer where both genres are pretty equally matched in terms of brilliant works. Um, you know, at the same time, when his prejudices get in the way, he misses a mark way off. I also think, it's funny, I was writing an introduction for uh, a Toni Morrison novel that's coming out that next year, and one of the things I talk about was language and how in, in a response to the kind of overflowed and servile English that we learned, that he certainly learned. If you read a, read a novel like To Sir With Love, you hear it. That Nepal went too far the other way. Where there was this mission to erase all lyricism from his work. There's a big difference between In a Free State and The Mimic Men. That um, there was almost a kind of a self-shame at work where how can we erase that the, the, the sing-songy of our mothers or our aunts or the people in the street or the way in which we brought musicality to literature? How can we erase all of that to this kind of astringent prose? And I think that to me is, is the consequences of, of a sort of a self-shame, that it did lead to an, an over-astringent kind of English. And it's specially pronounced in his nonfiction, I think, as mm -hmm. you implicit in the examples that you chose. Yeah, yeah because I think it 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 um it can lead to really powerful clarity, which it did in Middle Passage. Yeah. Um, but it can also go off, you know, completely off base, like Area of Darkness. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Mimic mm -hmm. Man, Middle Passage. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So. Um, Moving to your newer work, mm. um, I wanted to ask you, so you move from two or more novels that are very grounded in a place that is unmistakably Kingston, Jamaica, at different moments in time, you know, very textured kind of accounts of everyday life in, in Jamaica. Um, Two, your newest work, set in Africa, um, not as closely tethered to a particular place. So I wondered if you could first just talk a little bit about why you chose to set it in Africa mm -hmm. and why you used the genre that you did. What, what work did that genre do for you? Um, sure. And perhaps um, read a little bit from that novel also. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, I, you know, I, to me, funny enough, it didn't seem as dramatic a break from the previous books. Not that they're they're all in a continuum, but that um, I knew that eventually, as somebody interested in these kind of literatures, in African literature, in 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 folk literature, in folk music, in folklore and myth, that eventually I was going to end up here. And my, the first time I ended up looking at African myths and legends, it wasn't to write a novel. It was just to find a kind of a, a ground zero for me that was not slavery. Because even in the ways in which I learned history, the, the origin narrative was the Middle Passage. Um, and, it, you know, it's it's... It wasn't enough, and I think there, it, it creates a kind of, a, for me at least, a sense of running around headless. So initially, it was a fact-finding mission. It was, you know, how the, 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 the how can I find our myths and legends? I know all about Greek myth. I know all about Norse myth. I can I know enough about Norse to consult on Thor. No, no, I did that, but I could. <laughs> but. Um, and there is something about our mythologies that we don't 
sometimes we take for granted and even even taking mythology for granted is one of the benefits of mythology and what i mean by that is um you know margaret atwood was once asked how can you tell that humanity hasn't changed in a thousand years and she says check the mythologies mm. and she's right but then i found myself going but i i don't have mythologies to check I have no, and without them, there's a essential part of my own humanity that I don't have that, say, a British person does. Like, um, I was given a speech, a, a speech introduced to J.R.R. Tolkien a few years ago, and I mentioned that the average British person probably doesn't think about King Arthur much. But King Arthur is crucial because yeah. King Arthur and Camelot reinforces the idea that Britain was always civilized. Which is, of course, far from true. Britain was one of the most backward places in Europe. The Romans got there and they were astonished by the barbarity and the brutality. Um, but Camelot gives them a ground zero from which they can do rule of Britannia. Um, you know, when I, I don't have a Camelot, or at least I didn't until I started doing these books. I don't, I mean, you know, I mean, we can talk about how mythology is also used to, you know, bring about oppression. But they also create a sense of self. And I went looking for that, which is a very long-winded way of saying, I didn't go to these things to find and to write a novel, but in looking for them, a novel happened. Um, I just saw these stories and couldn't leave them alone. And it took a while before it started to be shaped into a book. And it took a while before the book shaped into a trilogy. I think I just started... In going around all these, not going around, in looking at all these stories, characters start to appear in my head. And, and most of my books start that way, where characters show up and just won't leave. And usually I can only get rid of them by writing about them. And, and that's sort of what happened. And of course, when you're writing a novel this way, there are on four or five, if not ten, false starts. Because there is, oh, that's not a story. Oh, that's not a story. Until you find a hit a character and you go, oh, this is the one I want to spend some time with. I write ten pages and I want to go more. And twenty and I want to go more. And that's, you know, that is what happened with um, Black Leopard. And, you know, in terms of a trilogy, I realized I wasn't done. I wouldn't be done with the story once I finished the first one. But I didn't realize it was a trilogy until I remembered films like Rashomon. Because I knew I wasn't interested in doing a part one, part two, part three. Right. What I was interested in was three different, sort of, let's call it three different versions of the same story. So different characters tell us exactly what happened. And, um, and that's what, that's what made the, the, the process exciting to me, knowing that the next character will tell something completely different than what the main character tells in Black Leopard, Red Wolf. That's a really beautiful, just a beautiful account of what, what drew you there. Um, Marlon, would you read a little bit from it? Just a couple of minutes? I actually, wanted to read, I actually wanted to read from the sequel, if that's... Oh, anything from the, the trilogy. Yeah, or, so this is a sequel called Moon Witch Spider King. You can see I'm already marking it up. And it, the, the one thing I would say is about Black Leopard Werewolf is that the character Sogolon is basically the villain. And in this, Sogolon is the hero, the heroine. And this is a passage that would tell us why. She's called the Moon Witch. She was called the Moon Witch in Black Leopard as a slur. Um, and, you know, it was used against her. And, and she did some really questionable things in Black Leopard. So this is a scene... Um, about, you know, that may cha challenge what people think thought about her in Black Leopard. Um, she's wounded and she's on a bed and she's been taken care of by a woman, an old woman. And at this point, she wakes up and somehow all these women show up. More women come into the room as it get lighter and still more women. Or perhaps I was seeing them all for the first time. You don't remember me, one of them say. She wear a band around the eyes that her husband take away from her. After you write the wrong done to me, the woman teach me how to see with my fingers, my ears, and my nose. She says she paint clay on my skin with grace. After my father killed my mother, he take to going after me, say another. The night you come, he was heading to my sister's bed. 
You don't know me, for then I was no woman, say yet another. I call each of these women my sisters since then, you remember us? The girls kidnapping that caravan. They were taking us out to sea to sell us off as wife and concubines. We was seven and eight. Each night they take away one of us to test the goods, and that girl would never return. That night he swooped down on my roof was the night I know the gods didn't forget us. Every woman in this room, touched by the moon witch, stepped forward, the Nim Nim woman say. And every woman in the room look at me and approach the bed and surround it. They take their time and let the quiet shuffle to the talking. Some look like faces I supposed to remember. Some look like faces I used to know. Many of them old. Some of them older than the child they was when they saw the moon witch. Woman with the galley of the east on her head. Woman with the igi of the south on her. Woman in white like nuns. Woman in rainbow like queens. Mother and daughter and sister and woman with no one. Woman with one eye, one ear, one leg, no legs. Woman, other women holding up. Ghosts of women who come back from the other world to see the moon witch. And a crabby one who say, boy, she did love that silver. Some with mouths packed to the brim with words. Some nodding quietly saying, we see you, sister. Woman who steal a touch of my shoulder. Woman who grab my hand until another pull, pull my hand into theirs. They packed the room right in, up to the doorway and still more was outside waiting to squeeze themselves in. A girl wormed through them to touch me and say, they couldn't move my mother, so she sent me. Moon which still flying through the trees, say another. Now plenty women writing wrong. Plenty in the north are now saying, Moon which she is me. Mm. Mm. Got to stop a minute to take that in. <laughs> I usually pause through and I wrote it. <laughs> Just beautiful. Just beautiful. I mean, one of the things that actually, you know, the way you just described how these the books in the trilogy are kind of different versions of the same story makes me think about how this kind of ability to write across um, or write out of different points of view really characterizes a lot of your work, right? I mean, there's a similar kind of... Um, move in a brief history of seven killings right um where you have how many characters oh my god or how many narrators maybe. <laughs> sorry say it again i can't remember it may have been anywhere between 50 and 70. okay um yeah so i remember a lot mm -hmm. um but um so I'm going to ask you a question because one of the things that, that I really admire about your work is this ability to write these different points of view, um, different genders, um, which is there even in Night Women, um, Kingston's inner city gang members, um, work written not only in the Caribbean but also in Africa. So just really writing across just huge kinds of differences. Um, and so, uh, the question that I actually have for you is, what do you think about the ways that the term cultural appropriation is used mm -hmm. these days? I, you know, it's funny. I, I don't know if, if people made a big fuss about cultural appropriation in literature until writers like Lionel Shriver started to talk about it. And, um, you know, and it, it's, it, it was... I don't know what exactly, you know, brought that about since writers have always been writing in different identities and they've always written in different genres. I don't know if it's a situation where the concern about cultural appropriation was a way of masking that they didn't want to be scrutinized. I think if you are, you know, a white woman from Brisbane and you want to write about the Maasai, you absolutely should. But at the same time, while you, your, your artistic right to write something doesn't escape you from criticism, it almost seems like this whole thing about cultural appropriation is just a, a, an attempt to not be critiqued. I think it's, it's um, that, you know, that one should write what they want. But at the same time, you should be scrutinized in the ways in which you fail to do so. I think you have a right to write everything, include it, but the critic also has a right to criticize everything. Um, what is happening, I think, 
is there is a certain kind of laziness when we're doing these things. And if you're going to write about if you're going to write about a character, if you're going to write about somebody who's not you, you have to get past a point where you are you have to ask yourself rather, are you writing a character? Are you reflecting? Are you embodying? Hell, even if you're observing a character or are you just projecting your fears and desires on them and reacting to it? What does that mean? It means the black people in Heart of Darkness. It yes. means just about any woman in any video game ever created, including whatever is going to be created today. These aren't women. These are six-foot Amazons with 44 double-D bosoms with 15 degrees, but can somehow run in 18-inch high heels. That's yes. not a woman. That's a projection of a desire that you literally do this to all day. Um, mm -hmm. And we do that. We do that in fiction. We do it all the time. Is this, you know, when, when a lot of white writers write about Africa, mm -hmm. um, are you embodying, are you just projecting your fears and desires? Is that why I can see all these dimensions to your antelope, but only one to an old woman? So mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's the, 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 cult, the term cultural appropriation I find not useful in literature, even for people who commit it, because mm -hmm. it ignores what it's, it's a, it, it ignores a, that it's a failure of imagination. That's what we're talking about. When people accuse a white person of writing wrong, they're not saying you shouldn't write an Indian okay. character. We're saying we're coming after your failure of imagination. We're coming after your failure of humanity. We're coming after your failure of empathy. Yeah. And it's and and you know and those are very those are serious those are serious thing, considerations, mm -hmm. and I think too often writers just go oh we're just being attacked. No, you're being criticized. Hell, sometimes you're being ridiculed because your character is stupid. There's a mm -hmm. book I can't remember the name of it. It's set in China, and the person has never been to China, mm -hmm. and they have a character, and I can't remember the name. But one of my Chinese friends came to me and go, does she know she named the guy favorite dog? <laughs> <laughs> she had no idea and of course in her arrogance and ignorance she didn't she didn't check the last thing i'd say about that about cultural appropriation is has anybody ever wondered why we rarely label that accusation at the crime writers That's because the crime writers the crime writers do the work only one right you know we we in america there's a whole religion around the wire as the greatest tv show of all time that no show has captured urban poor black life like the wire only one writer on the wire was black yeah right so the so the, the crime writers of which i'm very much in awe of the yeah. crime writers do the work the yeah. genre writers you know the good ones do the work yeah. Um, historically, that has not been true. Historically, the fantasy writers were the worst offenders. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. What I'm hearing you say is that um, basically, don't be lazy, do the work. Do the work, for example, also in historical fiction, that it's that V.S. Naipaul can in what he says, be just as objectionable and miss the point as mm -hmm. the white woman that you've described writing and there's no cultural appropriation involved there. It's a failure of work and a failure of vision. Yeah. But one of the things that just struck me um, is that, you know, you said it's a critique of laziness. Mm -hmm. right? And I think that's right. But I'm also wondering if part of if there's something potentially a little bit lazy about the charge of cultural mm -hmm. appropriation. Oh yeah, absolutely. Interested. You know, in the sense that there must be, or I, we need, I think, to develop a vocabulary so that we can distinguish between cultural appropriation as being fundamentally to do with inequality, tokenism. Um, exploitation, profiting off somebody else's stories, and mm. so on, and writing across difference as a form of imaginative labor, right? Yeah. That can be the basis of solidarity. So, um, well, and that's I mean, we've always profited from writing across cultures, and 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 so on. We've always done it. I'm not quite, you know, I don't think that's necessarily, um, you know, that's necessarily a problem. As I said, I I I will 
I am I have no problem against a good book. Really? <laughs> Regardless of, of what it is. I think it is. I think this is why which is why my suspicion this is my theory was that I don't know if any I, I it's it's almost I'm trying to use it, try to find an analogy that would explain what I'm saying. That I'm not sure people started screaming cultural appropriation before people afraid they'd be called that started to sort of get it defensive before without reason. Um, like uh, here's a bad analogy. Um, there's this artist who sued Mar who who um, sampled a Marvin Gaye song, and before yeah. Marvin Gaye's estate could sue. They sued the estate as a counter sue before they even sued it, before they were even sued. And then the yeah. estate was basically, you know, we wouldn't have even heard of this had you not counter sued us to a suit that we did not launch. So of course they, of course the people who the the the, the, the they lost. And the point was, you started a fight where there wasn't one. So now I'm going to go. Oh, hold on, maybe there's something here, and I, and I have a sneaky suspicion that's what happened with. Um, cultural appropriation. I think it's it is sometimes the problem with that is that sometimes you bring a sledgehammer to what needs a scalpel. Beautifully put. I had I was just going to say it's a blunt tool, but that's, that's <laughs> beautifully put. <laughs> so actually, um, I wanted to just shift gears a little bit, um, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, I wanted to ask you about suspense in your right. writing. Right, there's that amazing first line of Black Leopard, Red Wolf, which says, the child is dead, there is mm -hmm. nothing left to know, which of course immediately makes me want to know. Uh, <laughs> and, um, and your earlier novel, A Brief History, which is about the attempted assassination of Bob Marley, so it's mm -hmm. clearly at one level a whodunit. Um, or it's got that component to it. It's also got that Cold War plot where you see the moment um, of making the violence that we now associate so much with Jamaica. And somehow when I learned that your parents were both in the police force, and one of the, it's like something clicked for me because I was mm -hmm. like, Marlon just somehow lives, he knows what it's like to live inside detective fiction. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing, but... I also feel that you're doing something different with detective fiction, and I wanted to just ask you what it is about the sensibilities of detective fiction or suspense that appeals to you? What does it help yeah. you do, and how are you redirecting the genre? Yeah. I, you know, I mean, yes, I came from a family of detectives, um, but I also do think, I, I've said this before in, in, in several interviews, I do think writing is a form of detective work, mm. um, whether it's fiction or nonfiction. Um, I teach, I teach memoir and I teach essay. And one of the things that students are doing, which they've never had to do is excavate their own, excavate their own lives and interrogate their own lives. And I think those are two things I still do with fiction, I ex you know, excavate and interrogate. And um, it's just one of the reasons why I think most of the times my novels are in, I, mean, I think all but one of my novels are in first person. Um, mm -hmm. Because I, I do want to, you know, I'm very curious about how we think and how our minds work and what are we up to. And I, I look at characters as mysteries to solve and as this kind of onion where I have to keep peeling, peeling away layers until what I find surprises even me. The thing, um, there's, you know, usually sometimes people ask, do I know, did I know what the outcome of my characters and novels would have been? And I'm like, I had absolutely no clue because I am excavating as I'm, and interrogating as I, as I go along. And I am surprised sometimes. A lot of, all the times I'm surprised by what my characters do. And I think um, a really good mystery is something that continues to surprise you. If if you can tell who did it from the beginning, then it's of clearly not a mystery. Um, if you can tell why people operate the way they are, the way they do, then it's not. And I think it's not just growing up with a detective who could always tell them he robbed their work, robbed their purse, and who did it because we have different styles of stealing. 
Um, mm. But it was also detective fiction, whether it was Sherlock Holmes or Raymond Chandler, or even growing up, whether it's Hardy Boys and Bobsy Twins and Nancy Drew. And I never let go of that. Even now when I'm writing literary fiction, I start to think, what's the mystery that's, um, that's to be solved here? As for suspense, it's the same thing. You know, um, I have very, very mixed feelings about Charles Dickens, but I do think his, his motto, make them laugh, make them cry, make them wait, is something that I still follow and I still believe. And I, and, and I don't have it written down on my wall, but it usually is. You know, make them laugh, make them cry. Make them wait. That to me, in a, in we we you know we've written millions of words on the purpose of the novel, and I've never seen it any purpose, you know, more profound than those those three lines. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm seeing that. Uh, you know, one thing that's occurring to me about the way you're talking about um, fiction and suspense and surprise is that in that business of sniffing out stories, as Tracker puts it, you also get at these, at a number of underrepresented points of view and untold stories. But I'm seeing now that we have some questions from the audience. So um, in our remaining 10 minutes, could I ask you, um, I just share them, share a couple mm. of them with you and there, there are about five, so you can just um, time sure. your answers accordingly. So this question is from Sarah Varghese. You said you have had to unlearn a lot of what you learned studying literature for your bachelor's degree. What did you have to unlearn? Well, one I thing I had to unlearn was that whenever dialect appears, it's for comic value. That um, dialect is something that you should use as a sort of a seasoning, and an, an, an exotic seasoning. And dialect has, has no business being exotic seasoning in a Jamaican novel or an Indian novel or a Nigerian novel. Um, and I had to relearn that. I had to, I had to trust that the voice coming out of my own mouth was worthy of literature. And also the people. It's, you know, to read all this literature that was a foundation for my, my identity, and, and not my identity, but certainly my, lear my learning as a writer. And, and we're talking, you know, great novels, Tolstoy, Dickens, Jane Austen, all of that. But to read them is to also be outside of them. You know, there is a certain, you know, I think identifying with a character is something that may be overblown, honestly. As, as a as a form of literary merit, but at the same time, it's it's it does something to you. I think constantly reading about snow that you've never seen, or 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 values that you don't have, or people who don't look like you, and also like you. And when people like me appear in those works, again we have it wasn't a character; it was a projection. So I think. If I'm going to, for example, call Heart of Darkness a legitimate work of fiction, and it is, I also have to realize that the erasures in it aren't are flaws. And I think that um, there's nothing wrong. A, a great work can be a flawed work. And I think the failure of humanity in a lot of these books, less, you know, um, Sanditon or even Mansfield Park, which, yes, is a masterpiece, but in its it's in, in the way in which it treats people from the colonies or the islands, it's a failure. It's a failure of empathy. It's a failure of nerve. And I think that um, I had to unlearn that uh, the idea that I just just take these books as untouchable masterpieces. But the teacher said it. She says, "If this book wasn't a classic, we wouldn't be teaching it." I'm, like, I'm not, con you know, I'm not, you know, I'm I'm, I'm not necessarily. Um, you know, attacking a book being a classic, but I think a book should be interrogated. And I think we, if we're going to read, we should read, and we should read correctly. And I think that um, I got very far studying English literature without knowing that. So speaking of interrogation, here's a question from Ramona Mukherjee. Given your own strong opinions about various books, which you have aired in a series of podcasts with Jake Morrissey, what is your relationship with critics? Do you read reviews or do you look for feedback from a close group of close friends? 
I look for, the thing about reviews is by the time reviews have come out, the book has already been written. And, um, you know, I'm as human as everybody else. Um, I keep telling new writers, okay, read like three or four, then stop. For lots of reasons. One, a review is a conversation, to me, a review is a conversation between readers. <laughs> and I think, you know, one of the things I really resist doing, for example, is criticizing my friend's work once it's published. Because, one, they're going to really value my opinion. And two, I'm going to give them a criticism of something they can't fix. You know, the book is out there. It's so on. Why am I saddling somebody with that kind of complex about something they can't fix anymore? I'm not helping that friend. If two, three books later, we want to talk, and we go, hey, you know what I was thinking about that book you wrote four years ago or three years ago? I think that's different. Um, you know, I, I, so... I'm very much, a, a, you know, respect criticism, but I also sometimes recognize that criticism sometimes doesn't get what I was trying to do. Um, so I think even, I, I expect a healthy dose of skepticism in a critic, but I also have a healthy dose of skepticism in how I read criticism. Because even that in itself has a loaded history. You know, it's... Um, <laughs> People are still, you know, personal enemies of writers are still writing their reviews. It's kind of ridiculous. But I think, you know, but I also think, you know, funny enough, my main criticism with criticism is more is actually more academic mm -hmm. in the sense that too often what I see is a plot summary instead of, mm -hmm. of review, um, particularly when it's nonfiction, I think. But I think, yeah, I think um, if you're going to be a writer, you have to realize that this is a, this is a conversation that must happen. That um, whether it's praise or damnation, this is what happened. Books, the ultimately, the thing I love about criticism is that it reminds us that books are worth fighting for, but they're also worth fighting over. Yeah. And I think that that is, you know, that is important. Yeah. Um, so here's another question from Chitra Narayan. Um, you are now a celebrity, a black celebrity in the U.S. <laughs> How do you feel about that? Do you inhabit this label comfortably? I, you know, the cool thing about living in New York is that people really don't care. Um, I also, you know, I like to tell myself, well, you know, Book celebrity is not real celebrity. I'm not Taylor Swift. <laughs> you know, I'm not. You know, I'm a, I'm I'm not, I'm not I'm not whatever 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 is the famous Chris this week. Um, you know, but I, you know, I, at the same time, I do think that um, there is a weight put to what I say that probably wasn't there before, and there are things that I would have done. Um, even say seven years ago that I wouldn't do now. And I don't necessarily think necessary. It's it's about fame. Like I don't publicly start fights with writers. I don't necessarily publicly trash somebody's work, and not because you know whether or not the work deserves to be trashed or not. But I think I realize um, that there is a difference actually between bluntness and tact. And and learning that, I also realized that the 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 circle of people that have the funny thing about I guess be, becoming more well known is that your circle actually gets smaller, not bigger. And so you know I I, I you know recognize that, but I also I'm glad I'm in a place where I can be very very anonymous. It's very humbling realizing. You know, contrary to what I might think, you know, a lot of people don't read, and they're they're quite fine. They're quite fine with that. So it's it's um. That's interesting. Yeah, and also I, you know, the friends I knew when I was were four years old are still the friends I have now, and they are very good at being constantly unimpressed with me. Mm -hmm. Well. Um, Marlon, I think we are drawing to the close of our time. Um, were you going to add something? No, I was just noticing the, noticing the Garcia Lorca behind you. 
Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I'm, a, I'm so bad. I'm so bad. I cannot tell books by their spine. It's sad. Ah, okay. You've been reading my bookshelf all this time. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> Marlon, I would like to read your bookshelf and your remaining books uh, if I can keep up with them. Um, in about a minute, do you feel like telling us what is bubbling next? I have a feeling it's not haiku. That is no, not but it is certainly genre. this book, which is coming uh -huh. out in February. Um, so this is what's bubbling, really. Um, other than that, um, you know, I'm very excited actually about the introduction to the Toni Morrison novel that I wrote. Um, Toni Morrison is pretty much a getting star um, for me. Um, when I was writing this novel, actually, two books were on my desk the whole time, Beloved and Hilary Mantel's Wolf Hall. And, um, and yeah, so th th that, but also just getting this book out there and working on the final volume of this trilogy, which I think I'm just going to go straight into. Wow. Wow. Well, thank you, Marlon. Thank you for the gift of your writing and for your time today. And to the audience, thank you for joining us and thank you for your questions. I hope you will put off whatever else it is that you're supposed to be doing and read Marlon's novels. You won't be able to put them down. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that conversation. Um, I think everything that was said today is so important for writers everywhere to take note of. Um, thank you to our speakers. Thank you to our audience for being here today. Um, the sessions from Tata Literature Life, co-sponsored by Tata Steel and Tata Projects and powered by Godridge, are available online, so do check them out on the website. Uh, the books uh, from today's session, Marlon's books, are available on our uh, knowledge.